All right. Uh, here we are at State of Mind. And uh, if you like what you see, you just hit the little button right here instead of subscribe <laughs> this little button. Um, I have somebody who, when I first started General Hospital, he, he was there. So he's one of the first people I probably met at General Hospital. And Sean Kanan is what I call a, a renaissance man. This guy does, like, he cooks, he acts, he created a freaking really good series on, called Studio City. You seen that yet? And what else does he do? What else? Oh, he's, he, now, well, we'll get into that more, but. Hi, Sean. How are you? It's great to see you. It's great to see you, brother. You know, you you know, you're one of these people that I don't get a chance to see enough, and I I always love when I have a chance to talk to you because it's always a very authentic and connected conversation. I'm really looking forward to just being here one on one with you, and uh, and you never know what's gonna. You. you well, no, but I, that's also you know that's how you are with your acting too, which I love. Uh, Unless you shoot me, and then it's yeah, that's true. Oh no, I got a lot of stuff for that. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about Sean. Um, you know, I play this character on General Hospital, and it's always like you know, Sonny can do no wrong, but he he played my son's real father, mm -hmm. and when I shot him, the hatred. <laughs> And I don't want to get into the history of General Hospital, <laughs> right? But the hatred that I got from the fans was unreal. And really? also, even another thing I did. There's only I'm going to be honest with you. I've done a lot on GH, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes they don't like me, but most of the time it's that's fine. It's fine. Sunny, it's fine. Sunny's fine. But when I shot you, yeah, and I put the other uh, Billy Warlock on a on a hook on a, on a hook. I heard about that. <laughs> Fans are like, nah, he's crossed, he crossed the line. The line. <laughs> um, and now he wrote a book called The Way of the Cobra. Tell me, wh why'd you write the book, Sean? I mean, what was your... So the genesis of the book was that about three years ago, I was in a place where, I think, I think you can relate to this, I had had some pretty significant success. I had had some epic failures, some of which were well publicized, and uh, like what failure? Like, well, I mean, listen, you know, I, I like I, talking I, about failure. Sure, I mean, you know, I've had uh, I've had my struggles. Um, you know, I've had to deal with uh, substance issues in my oh, life. Oh yes. I mean, I've you know, I've dealt with a lot of stuff. I mean, as a young kid, I dealt with bullying a lot. So I mean, listen, everyone has their crosses to bear, right? Yeah. Um, but I was in a place where I was looking in the mirror and I was 50 some years old and I said, what's next, man? Like what, what's act two? I was 35 pounds overweight. I had no prospects for work and I decided I needed to start doing some stuff very differently, very quickly. And rather than wait for my ship to come in, I decided I was going to build the damn ship. I just had to figure out how was I going to do it? And I started doing some things very differently, and I started having some amazing results relatively quickly. And in that one year, I wound up co-authoring my second book, Success Factor X, which became an Amazon new release bestseller. Um, we finally got Studio City made and on Amazon Prime and nominated for eight Emmys, and we won one. Um, uh, and I lost the 35 pounds. And I don't say that as a way of impressing people. I say it as a way of impressing upon people what you can do when you make some significant changes. Right. And these are the battle-tested strategies and the philosophy that I live by that has allowed me to achieve uh, some of the success in my life. And, you know, it's funny. I, I always thought I got into acting because I wanted to express myself. And I think at the time that, that was probably yeah. accurate. But as I've gotten older, I've realized that what I really want to do is inspire people. Yeah. And yeah. that acting is only one conduit to yeah. doing that. You know, that I can do it with my writing. I yeah. can do it with my speaking. And so, you know, yeah, I'm doing a lot of podcasts and publicity for my book, which is what one does when you have a book. Sure, I want to sell books. But from the bottom of my heart, I want to get this book into as many people's hands as possible because I know the information in it is transformative.
I'm with you because I, I kind of feel the same way. Absolutely, like, with everything I'm doing. But uh, I want to get into. I want to get specific because I, sure. I kind of I want to because I, I like human behavior and I like yeah bullying. Let yeah. me tell you something about. I want you to tell me about bullying, but let me tell you my my feeling about it first. I hate it. Absolutely. And I was never bullied. I can't stand it. But I, when I would see anyone, that's why I love Bruce Lee, Billy Jack. Love Come Billy on, Jack. Dude. dude. I have wanted to make a movie about the life of dude. Tom Laughlin. I reached out to Tom Laughlin three times before he died. And I said, please, I want to make the story of your life. And you know, so many people now probably don't know who I he know. is. But what they don't realize is, this is the actor who played Billy Jack, but not only that, he ran for president. Yes. He owned a studio. Yes. I mean, if you know this guy's story, he was this iconoclastic guy that swam against the tide yes. and made it work. And so he is yes. absolutely one of my idols. And a great actor. And a great actor. Yeah. Uh, so, see? I mean, I, I, you know, and all that, Bruce Lee. And stood up against the bullies. And stood up, yeah. Yeah. Now, I was never bullied, but I, like I said, I would see, uh, anytime I'd see somebody get bullied, the bully would get his ass kicked by me. Yeah. So you were bullied severely. No, no, no. Yeah, really? yeah, really. So, so what happened? So when I was a young kid, um, I grew up in a, a you know fairly rough town in western Pennsylvania, Steel Town. Okay. And I was, um, you know, I was I was a chubby kid. I was Jewish, which you know I was probably like the only Jewish kid in, you know, my my for sure my class and probably one or two of us in the whole school. And you know, I think anytime you're different for any reason, yeah, you know, you, you got to remember, kids, you're dealing with a bunch of sociopaths yeah. because that's mostly what kids are because their brains aren't fully formed. You know yes. what I mean? Yes. Um, and so I used to get, um, I used to get bullied really badly, and um, it started to change when I was about 14 years old, and I stepped into a, a martial arts dojo for the first time in my life. Really? But it's not just because I learned martial arts. I, I learned. Um, I learned confidence. But I want to know, Sean, just, uh, sure, uh, sure. I just want to know how it's, you know, those are little things that, how uh, it you, felt you, it. You, humiliating. Um, you know, one of the most vivid memories I have. You're going to um, make me cry. Well, know. no, but I'm, I'm going to be honest. One of the most vivid memories I have, I have two that really stick out and I'll, I'll share both of them oh, with you. No. But, you know, I used to get, and I talk about this in the book, okay. I used to get chased home from school and um, I, I figured, okay, you know, they, they're not going to chase me onto my front lawn. And, and I used to always pray that's not the day my dad decided to come home from lunch to see his kid getting chased home from school, you know, being bullied. And it was humiliating. Of course it was. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of that went into constructing the fabric of who I was as a young adult yeah. and why as a younger guy for a long time, I'd say even into my late 40s, you know, really frankly, until I, until I got married to my wife, Michelle, did I have a paradigm shift in a lot of stuff? Just a lot of insecurity, a lot of, um, it manifested in my acting with that need to push, which, you know, that's one of the biggest mistakes actors make. Yes. And as soon as I felt okay with myself and truly confident, my acting changed. And, and oh, so, yeah, 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 because you, you felt like you had to do more. Yeah. You got to, you know, to you got to show instead of no, and it should be no and shut yes. instead of show. So that was, that was, that was one, um, really, and that happened many times. Cause I saw a scene you did in uh studio city. Yeah. You weren't pushing anything, bro. Yeah. Well, you know, you it's, were on target. Thank you. I appreciate you were, that. You were subtle. It was cool. Thank you. You were just, you know, present. You. So that's a trick because yeah. of your childhood and, yeah. and, and, and Whatever you felt when you were being bullied, now you feel like you gotta overdo it. You know, and the thing, and the thing that was crazy was I, I also had a few experiences with adults that were really traumatic, and one of them was I, I'll never forget this. I must have been in second grade, and I remember we were in the library with all the kids. It was like library class, and I, I'll never forget this teacher. She, uh, she looked at me and she said, "If you want to talk." you can crawl out of here. And she made me get my hands and knees and crawl. No. Yeah, from all the kids. Yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, could you imagine like today? No, like, I mean, you, you can't you, do that. You'd own the school. You I mean, so you yeah, crawled yeah, yeah, out of yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, no choice. I mean, you know, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one other story that I didn't plan I on telling it, you. Man. But I'm going to tell you one other one because it dovetails into it. The first movie I ever did, I will never forget this. And I, you know, I feel so... 
embarrassed and stupid about it. But it got down to me and one other guy for the lead. And so they brought us both into this conference room. There were men and women in this. And they said, we need you to take off all your clothes to see if you have tattoos. This guy and I, we looked at each other and went, okay. I mean, I was 20, 20 years old. I'd never been on a set. I mean, you know, this is brand new to me. I took off all my clothes. And so I've produced a lot of stuff. Wait, wait, but you didn't yeah. were naked. Bro. Yeah, I was naked. We were naked. Yeah. And I wound up getting the, I wound up getting the role. Um, and um, as, as a producer, uh, I was doing a film one time and we had to have um, uh, one of the actresses needed to be topless for a scene. And I told the director to leave the room. Um, I left the room. I think I left two women in there that were part of the producing team because we had to see, we had to see what she looked like, but I was never going to let somebody be humiliated or made to feel the way that I was. And, and I would like to think that I would have done that anyway, Yeah. but I certainly did it as a result of having been in, you know, almost an identical, if not worse situation when I was a really young actor. Wow. Yeah. And I'm going to say something but I, that I've never said anywhere. And I won't get into it. It's not even in my book anywhere. Really? Yeah. But I won't. I can't get specific. Okay. But I can tell you that a similar situation happened to me. Yeah. And uh, <sighs> it at the time, it didn't seem, it seemed kind of normal but now i fucking hate it yeah i fucking hate it yeah so i can kind of relate to you brother in in a in, yeah. in a way I mean, yours is much more drastic and, and and that only happened to me once right once is enough though once is enough yeah you know one of the things i talk about in the book is the importance of attaching stories to things and i, I say that you know human beings are generally terrible historians. If you told me the story of your life, even your book, which which I'm sure is completely accurate, but you you, no, yeah, you yeah. made that into a movie compared to the actual movie of everything. Because we 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 process things through the prism of are we male or female? Our socioeconomics. We live in America. Blah 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 blah, blah right? So I'd say at best our recollection of any event is maybe 30% 100% accurate. Right, right. So if, if, we, if we agree that we're lousy historians, I say, why don't we attach positive stories to the events that happen to us? Because so often, something that happens that might seem initially devastating, catastrophic, we, we relegate it to being negative. With the expansion of time, we see how it really plays out yeah. in our life. You know, I remember when I was divorced, yeah. um, uh, it was it was crushing for me. I was on General Hospital. And I think that led into a lot of the <sighs> emotional stuff I was going through when I was in General Hospital. Um, but when I got divorced, it was it was crushing and devastating. But had that not happened, it wouldn't have opened me up to meet Michelle, of course. which has been the greatest thing of my life. Yeah. And had I known that that was what was waiting for me. Would I have attached such a negative story? Yes, yes. This is a failure. I like that. Blah, 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 blah. So, you know, um, uh, that's, that's a really big thing. You know, I'll just, I'll just end it with, with one sort of analogy. You know, you take two boys raised in identical households. The father's an alcoholic. He's abusive to the mother. He can't keep a job. The kids live in terror. The first son, unfortunately, he grows up and he mirrors his father's behavior. He winds up having the same right. problems. The second kid, says, I'm never going to put my family at risk. I'm never going to physically abuse them. I'm never going to make them worry where their next meal is coming from. And I'm never going to drink, or I'm going to drink extremely responsibly. And the trajectory of these two lives coming from identical um, experiences take dramatically different turns. And a lot of it has to do with the story that each one of them associated with it. Yes. The one kid says, look, this is my, in my DNA. This is where I come from. My dad's a piece of crap. I'm probably going to be a piece of crap too. The other kid used it as as a motivating yeah. why to change yeah. his life. It's like Eckhart Tolle has a he's a yeah. wealth of power now. Sure. He has a same kind of similar situation. He says, "Why is it you have one guy in prison pulling his hair out, banging his head against the wall, right. 
he can't do it. And then you have another guy in the same in another cell painting. Yeah. State of mind. Yeah. It's yeah. like what the yeah, narrative the state is. of mind. You're absolutely right. Or he or he puts himself through law school and he yeah. finds and he finds some uh, f uh you know something that allows his appeal to finally yeah. get you know overturn his case or something. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about Karate Kid a little bit? No, because I'm so I'm so like sure we can talk about it. it's your show. We can talk about anything you want. <laughs> how how how'd you get it, man? That's a boy. Big movie. So I've, I've I've told this story so Karate many times, Kid and I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to tell it, and it's in the book too. And again, I I I'll tell you the story, but I attach it to the concept of story, and you'll see why. So um um I I was finishing my political science degree at UCLA, and my martial arts teacher. Uh, was a gentleman named Sensei Fumio Demura. And Sensei Demura also happened to be Pat Morita's stunt double. Uh -huh. And he knew that I was trying to act. And he he said to me, um, he had a very thick Japanese accent. He said, Sean, you need to go and make for audition for Karate Kid 3. And um, they had an open call. And so I had done one episode of a show. Listen to how incestuous things are. It was a show called Werewolf. That John J. York was the story. Yes, star. yes. So I was John J. York, yeah, John G. A. We love John. Yeah. Um, and so I went to the casting director's office and I said, "Hey, I'm a real actor. You know, I've got my SAG card. I've done one episode of TV. Right. You know, can I audition?" And she said, "No." And so I had to go to the open call, and there must have been fifteen hundred. 2,000 guys yeah. lined up around the studio. Some of these guys brought martial arts weapons with them. I mean, it was, it was wow. crazy. Um, and there at the end of the line is John J. Evelson. He'd won the Academy Award for Rocky. He had directed the first two Karate Kids. And I knew he was making his way up the line, had a video camera, because John used to videotape everything, um, had his first AD with him. And I knew, I knew I had probably two or three seconds to get this guy's attention somehow and get him to stop. And I, I did. For some reason, he stopped and he, he asked me to do an improv with him. And I don't remember exactly what I said. He said, intimidate me. And I said something to the effect that if he didn't give me an audition, he was going to see me in his kitchen that night with a butcher knife. And he, he looked and he goes, I buy it. And set me inside and, and into the Man. soundstage. And it was like a three ring circus. I mean, if it was insanity outside, he was crazy inside. There was entertainment tonight. There was Access Hollywood. And, and the whole thing is, you know, to think that you're going to find one of your leads in the third installment of a successful franchise through an open call is crazy, wow. which led me to believe as I've gotten older, it was a publicity stunt. Yeah, I mean, yeah. sure, if they found the guy, they found them. Yeah. But, you know, it was the third It was the third one. It needed a shot in the arm. They needed some press, which they got a lot out of. Right. So anyway, so um, I go inside and um, they throw me in the makeup chair and there was like nine other guys and I'm kind of specking them out. And I'm like, okay, this is the competition. And there's Ralph Macchio. And they had uh, built a, 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 a stage. And they, right. they said, no, I mean, I had barely started studying acting with Roy London. I had, you know, I had a lot of, I was like, I was like so many other kind of young, good looking guys with some charisma trying to parlay that into yeah. a career, but no technique or anything like that. So they, they put me uh, on this, this makeshift stage with Ralph and they said the same thing. They said, they said, um, they said, intimidate him. And so I went, ah, and I back him in this corner and he's like, call him off, call him off. And then it started occurring to me, okay, did I go too far? Is this guy going to think yeah. I'm a, a real nut job? And so I saw him and he kind of smiled and I smiled and I was like, okay, I thought I did a great job. And I did do a great job. And I was driving back to my shitty little apartment uh, above the Whiskey A Go-Go on Sunset. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was night and the lights just took on a different you know, characteristic. And as I saw the Hollywood sign, you know, while we say it's either yeah. sort of laugh, it's either laughing at you or it's smiling at you. Yeah. It was definitely smiling. And so a couple of days later, I, I, you know, I'm riding high. A couple of days later, I learned the crushing truth. I didn't get the job. And I, I swear to you, and I, I know you can relate to this. I never had felt the depths of mm. despair at that point yeah. in my life because I honestly thought I was going to get it. As luck would have it, they hired someone else. Guy worked for a week. He didn't work out. No. I get a phone call around 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, I think it was. Uh, come back to the studio. Now, I knew they weren't calling to tell me I didn't get the job again, but I figured, okay, there's like, you yeah. know, like a buddy or something. I get there. There's Robert Mark Kamen in the producer's office who 
uh, created the Karate Kid films, went on to do Taken and The Transporter and all that stuff. And uh, he's a martial artist, had me do a couple basic moves. He goes in the other room, there's John Avelson, there's Sheldon Schrager, who's the uh, executive in charge of production. And they, they leave the door open so I can kind of see what's going on. Next thing I know, Shell Schrager pokes his head out. He goes, you got the job. He goes, this is what you're making, go to wardrobe. Like, I didn't even have time to call my parents. I mean, it was, it went like faster than beer through a Shriner. I mean, I was, you know, put through the works. They were already, you know, they were already behind now. You know, they thought they had the guy. Now, yeah. Don't forget, it's not just a function of, um, you know, rehearsal and things like that. There's massive amounts of choreography. And that takes a lot of time uh, to learn. Yeah. Biggest, the biggest rule is you don't want to hurt Ralph. You don't yeah, want to hurt anybody, yeah. right? So um, I got the job, and uh, um, we had been filming for about two weeks, and we were breaking for Christmas. I was having some pretty severe pain in my left thigh, which I attributed to all the karate I was doing. So I was taking handfuls of aspirin. So I drove to Vegas with a girl I was dating at the time. We drove in her Jeep going through the desert. I'm looking out at the stars and I'm thinking, holy crap, man, I'm, I'm 21 years old. I'm living my dream. Wow. This is amazing. So we get to Vegas and um, I'm at the Dunes Casino. The pain's getting worse in my leg. And I remember I had three $100 bills in my hand. We were gambling and I, I didn't pass them out. Boom, I hit the ground. The, uh, the hotel security comes, EMTs come. What had happened was I had to do this stupid stunt. It had nothing to do with karate. I had to literally stand in a stationary position, jump like two feet and land on my side. They were going to take that shot, put it together with a shot of me coming yeah. through the door. Blah, blah, blah. So anyway, what had happened was I had perforated my omentum, which is this protective sheath, sheath that wraps around your intestine. I was bleeding internally and the blood was tapping against my femoral artery, causing all the pain. Okay, aspirin is a blood thinner. It exacerbated the bleeding. So um, I'll never forget. I was in the uh, I was in the ambulance, and I heard them say he's dying. No, Christmas Day, nineteen eighty nine. Everyone else is unwrapping. But were you still working? Well, we were on break. Oh, you were on break. So they they get me to the hospital, and uh, they say, listen, they say uh, we have to we have to operate on you. And I said, okay, what you mean like Monday? They go, no, 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 in ten minutes. So I come from a family of doctors, and so I had them call my grandfather and my uncle, who's a plastic surgeon, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And my grandfather had told them what he thought it was, and he was right. And so they're taking me into emergency surgery, and I, I, I never forget, there was this little Indian doctor, and you know I could see the anesthesiologist, they're about to put the mask on me. And I, I said to the doctor, I said, please tell me you're good. I grabbed this guy by his lapel and I said, tell me you're good. He goes, don't worry, I'm good. And I said, okay, listen, if you can avoid cutting my abdominal muscles, please don't cut them. Because I knew if they cut through my abdominal muscles, because it was gonna be explode. like I still have a scar this big. And, no. Oh yeah, and, if, and so I knew if they had to gut me like a catfish and go right through the muscle, I was out of the movie. You can't heal from that quick enough. Oh. I knew if they resected the muscle, I'd have a chance. So I come to. Staples all up and down, angry scar. It's a guy in bed next to me because they could only get maybe the, you know, it was Christmas. They were they were full up, and uh, that guy eventually died. And there's my dad. He's sitting there. He's gray. He's sitting like you are right now, just gray. He'd flown through the night. My parents could only get one ticket on such short notice. They decided my dad was going to go. My mom would come out later. And uh, about a day or two later, I get the call from John Abelson. He says, "How you doing?" I said, he says, look, uh, if you're not back at the set in 10 days, you lose the role. We're going to cast Brandon Lee. And no flowers, no get well kid, none of that shit. This was, this was welcome to Hollywood. And so wow. I decided, and you know, I, I, so it just, something turned in me. I went from feeling sorry for myself for about an hour to getting pissed off. And the first day I could get out of bed and I could walk over to my bathroom in the room. And the next day, I could walk around the hallway, the entire hospital floor. And the day after that, around three times. And the day after that, around five times. And I had them discharge me against medical advice. And um, I got in touch with the studio. And we were talking. And they said, okay, we have enough of you on film. We're going to keep you, but we'll, we'll get a stuntman. 
So I'm kind of on the sidelines. I'm watching the stuntman train. And with, with all due respect to him, I was, I was better than he was. I mean, I was, you know, I was really trained to do this. And so they put me with this guy named Kyle Borland, who was a lineman for the Rams. And Dan Isaacson, who um, it was a world famous uh, physical fitness guy, had a, he had a gym on the studio. And so they had me start working out there. And it was the same deal. The first day I could do 10 sit-ups and then 50 and then, you know, 500. And long story short, um, I, the kid stayed in the picture. I wound up finishing the entire film doing all of my own stunts. No. With, with the exception of one. There's a scene where the bad guys are in a car in a convertible and they go whipping across the train tracks as the train goes by. And I was like, there is no way that I fought my way back into this film to get taken out by a train. So I did all that. And, the, and, and what, I'm, what I was going to tell you about how I, how I bring it all around with the concept of story is, you know, I audition. I'm, I'm at the top, man. I think I'm going to get the role. I don't get the role. I'm at the bottom. Blah, 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 blah. I'm in the film. I'm back on top. Now I'm injured. Blah, blah. And, right. But here's the thing. Without the expansion of time, a lot of times we don't know what the future is going to hold so if you can try and maintain a, a positive story, a positive association to everything, even in the face yeah, of yeah. things uh, that happen that are difficult and bad and challenging, it can really make the difference between ultimately succeeding and, and not. I, I agree with you 100%. And I, and I do know that with, with, with life, I don't know what it is, man, but it, it, it hits you with great stuff and then it hits you with yeah, tough stuff. It does. And you just have to deal with the tough stuff and you'll get the great stuff again. Absolutely. And yep. if you believe in God, absolutely, that's what it is. I mean, uh, I've been through so much in my life. Last year I went through something that was very traumatic that I didn't think I would get through. But here I am a year later. Kicking ass. Kicking ass. Yeah. So, but you, we have to, we have to know whether it's, even if it's, really difficult and you think you can't do it you can you can my wife says i know that paula's like michelle that's your michelle your paula right yeah absolutely um that's one of the things i really liked about your book i mean I yeah just, she just stood just right. just yeah you know and i've known paula for a really long time but not known her yeah and now and you know we've, we've taken heather to italy yeah, and yeah. you know our lives have interwoven over the right. years but but reading your book i i the only word I can use to say it is I just felt so much closer to you. I really did. Yeah. And Paula, I was like, wow, I, I kind of, your, your love story is so beautiful. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, it's going, a, but, I like me. But it really, um, I, I didn't know about Paula's difficult background. Oh, yeah. And when you see what a success she is now to have, I mean, could you imagine if she had adopted the story of, you know, this is who my mother is, you know, the deck stacked against there me. There you go. Yes. Blah, 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 blah. blah. In, in, you know, I never, you know, with Paula, it's in the book, but for people who haven't read the book, um, you should read the book. Yeah. Believe me. I, 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 tried to, I, she wouldn't let me go to her house to pick her up because her yeah. family, yeah. I finally went to her house and it, and it was a bunch of basically drug addicts. And, right. And I, so we go to the car and I say to her, I said, she goes, now you know why I never wanted to pick me up. And yeah. I said. I don't care if you're rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I care about you. That's what right. matters. Right. And she and I said, you should be running because I'm fucking, I'm fucking <laughs> bipolar. I just got out right. of a mental institution. Right, right. And then, uh, and then she said, uh, I don't care. Yeah. And I just went, okay. Yeah. You know, my my acting teacher used to say something that I, I to this day I remember. He said, "Love is when two people each have a hole in their heart." And when the wind blows through, it plays the same song. I always thought that was so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that, you know? but you know, I also that's very true. That's the love part. But I do believe, not always, but it's it's nice to be like the yin and the yang always work. Absolutely, right, Sean? For sure, for sure. You, you, you guys are different, right? You, and very, well, well, we 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 have a you lot are of, and you're not. We have a lot of things that are similar, but we have very very different skill sets. Yes, um, I think we look at life the same. In a lot of respects, but we really um, complement each other. Yes, you know. And my wife has been um, a wonderful teacher to me. She's got the patience of Job. Yeah, <laughs> you have to. Same with, same with Paula. <laughs> um, and you know, I like to think I bring something to the table too. So yeah. it, you know, it works out. Um, 
Let me go back a little bit. Sure. And then I'm going to end it with something else. Uh, the drinking. Yeah. How did that manifest itself? And how did you, did you ever suffer from depression or? You know, I never really suffered to, for, with depression. Um, I, I think, though, that when I was younger, I really just, I wasn't happy. Uh, mm. I was in a, a marriage where I wasn't happy. Mm. Um, I, you know, a lot of my early work experiences, um, I, you know, I, I had some difficulty and didn't feel appreciated. And I think rather than depressed, I would get angry and I would lash out, mm. but I would lash out by drinking. And I also think, you know, that, um, you know, I, I, I certainly am not bipolar, but I, I have, um, I have some anxiety issues. They've gotten better as I've gotten older, but I think a lot of it was self-medicating. Yeah, you know, um, I believe you know people always meet me and they think, "Oh, you must be the guy that was the popular frat boy," and you know, the blah 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 at every party. Like I'm the guy at a party, pretty much within five minutes, you're gonna find me out in the balcony or in the back, just sort of sitting by myself. You know, I I would drink sometimes because it would put me at ease. For a while, would you become that guy now if you? Drink? Yeah, yeah, it would. Because I remember yeah. you were like the, you were hella like loud and great. And... I'm still loud, trust me. <laughs> Ask my wife. But it is um, self med. It is. It is self medicating. Um, um, and you got to stop that. Or you're gonna you, especially if you're mentally ill. Yeah. If you, yeah, I don't drink don't, or do drugs, but if I did, yeah, I yeah. wouldn't be here. That's yeah. that's that's just. A well, fact. you know, here's the thing though. You know, um, I I do still drink. Um, but I have a very different relationship. I don't do drugs, but I, I yeah. do still drink. But I have a very different relationship with alcohol now than I used to. Because when I drink now, I'm drinking to have a good time. And I'm not drinking to lash out yeah, and, yes, and all yes, of that. Yes. And also, you know, my my basic framework right now, my marriage, which is the framework of my life. My career comes second. My marriage comes first. My basic framework makes me happy and feel fulfilled and feel confident and good about myself so that I'm yeah. not, you know, I'll, I'll tell you another thing. I, um, I, God, I've never talked about this. This is going to be weird. Um, and it was during general hospital too. Um, I had a pretty serious gambling issue Ooh. for a while. Um, it was, and now, you know, that I will get you cause I had oh, a little yeah. bit of a, and you know, the thing is I used to win a lot. Oh, and I, oh I've, I've won a lot of money, and I've lost too, obviously. Steve used to too. Steve, yeah. oh, what Steve and I used to go Jason. to Jason. His place, Jason. <laughs> oh, you know how to Yeah, he would gamble like it. Not yeah, anymore, but he yeah, would. Yeah, but no, Steve and Steve was there with me for for some yeah. of those trips. But you know, I, and I don't know what happened, and I I guess a lot of it I attribute to my marriage again because. Um, you know, I was just filming a movie in Puerto Rico, and there was a, a casino uh, right around the corner from me. And I only went one time because another, when Michelle came in, or she was there with me, we went over there to go meet for a drink or something. But like, it, it has no hold on me anymore. It has no no interest yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. And it had such a hold. But what I used to do, I mean, you know, my, my ex-wife used to go off to work, and I used to go right to the airport, go to Vegas, Come back before she and I no and, and I used to do it and I swear to you, Maurice, there were times I did it. I can remember there was a time I think I did it two or three times in a week once, and I was obviously acting out about something. And it's I was thinking about that last night, and I was like, thank God that 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 monkey got off my back because that one is every bit as destructive as heroin or anything else. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, like it, it, it just, it just, oh yeah, devastates, yes, your life, yes. Um, I was lucky that I got out before my life was devastated, and and I've, I've, you know, largely been able to, you know, rebuild my life into a much better life, yes. But, but that was, that was kind of learning the hard way. I, I wouldn't say I dodged a bullet. I would say, you know, I had a, a baptism by fire, but somehow made it through yeah. the other side. So, so I've definitely had my demons. And that doesn't mean I don't continue to have, you know, one of the things I say in this book is I say, listen, before you think that like I'm living in a, in a hut, uh, uh on top of some mountain in Kathmandu levitating, contemplating my, my navel, the information in this book is because I've <laughs> been an asshole and made every mistake in the book. 
and banged my head against the wall. Yeah. It had to learn a lot of this the hard way. Yeah. And so, you know, I say in the book that there's there's a lot of great information, but a lot of it you're going to have heard before. And I said, I hope, my, my humble hope is that, that I'm going to be the messenger that's going to allow it to finally sink in. You know, especially boys. Girls too, though. But, but boys, when we're like 15 and 16, you, you have that antagonistic right, relationship right. with your dad. Right. And it doesn't matter what they're saying at that point in time, no matter how good the information is. You can't hear it because you're being bombarded by the chaos of, of the dysfunctionality of the relationship. Right, right. And then as you grow up a little bit, you know, yes. it gets better. So a lot of the stuff that I say in the book, you may have heard before, but you're going to hear it with maybe clearer ears. Yeah. And um, I want to talk to you about, to end this beautiful talk we've had. Yeah. I don't think we've gotten this deep. Ever. Never, never. Never. This is great. I love this. this but I, good. but I, this is what, I, these are the kind of conversations I, I love having. I know. Right? Because I think a, a lot, like you, I'm very good one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. I, I get when there's, a, when there's a lot of people. No, I'm the same way, yeah, bro. Yeah. I either sort of hide, I, I, I'm better now than I used to be, but I, I used to tend to have to hide behind kind of a facade I'm or, I'm yeah. better one-on-one. -on -one, and what happens is yeah. when you put another two or three people in here, yeah. I start getting a little more nervous, a little clamming up. Yeah, yeah. But one on one is jam. Is that funny? Uh, well, I, I want you to talk a little bit about uh, just because I'm impressed about Studio City. Just oh, how, thank you. How it started and you know yeah. whatever. Just you know, well, Studio. I don't want to not talk about it. Sure, sure. Yeah. Studio City has been a baby of mine for a very long time. It's a project that I have been trying to get made for. If I'm being really honest probably about 17 or 18 years. Are you serious? Yeah, it wasn't called Studio City, in different incarnations. Um, and we're in Studio City. And we're in Studio City. Yeah. And through a series of very helpful relationships, not the least of which has been Michelle, who's a producer and uh, uh, Emmy-nominated you know, writer for the show, uh, through our showrunner and director and my partner, uh, Timothy Woodward Jr., um, uh, and and two guys from my hometown, Jason Antignoli and Brian Levine, it finally came to fruition. And it really has been um, one of the most amazing things that, that's ever happened because this, this really, you know, uh, from the embryonic phase was an idea. And now to see these amazing actors and everybody, you know, come together, work so hard together and, and for for it to be recognized is unbelievable. And this character is really extremely close to who I am. I mean, I would say that that I'm I'm a more evolved guy than my character is, but he's very much um, like a Xerox copy of maybe, you know, seven or eight copies before, you know what I mean, when yeah. it starts to fade? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, for the people that haven't seen the show, it's uh, it centers around a guy that's an aging soap star. And, you know, you, you think this guy has the world by the tail and you learn very quickly that he is an incredibly flawed guy. He's trying to figure it out. He deals with a lot of the same crap we all do, whether it's family, career, coworkers, et cetera. And um, the show deals with a lot of socially relevant issues. Um, uh, we, we actually made history. Uh, we have a brilliant actor named uh, Scott Turner Schofield, who is... Uh, a transgender man. He's the first transgender man, I believe, to ever be nominated for a Daytime Emmy. Are you yeah. serious? And so he made history That's and great. our show made history. And, you know, we do it in a way that, you know, we don't beat you over the head. Nobody wants to be lectured to. No, no. So we kind of make you laugh sometimes. We make you cry. And um, it's 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 been really, uh, it's been remarkable for me. Right on. Yeah. I pre That's, uh, you know, I, I, it, and it looks great. That's another thing yeah. that's important. Well, I think we should get you on sometime to do something on. I'll do it. You will? I we're, okay. I'm going to hold you Michelle. to it. I'm going to hold you. You heard it here, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, give me a cool little role. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you a great role. I would love that. That yeah. would be so much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, yeah, bro. We we talked about you for a role, and we we you know because of COVID, um, we we did these five. Oh, I was fucked. Up. You have to understand. I know when that happened, but I was 
messed up, yeah. that was the time that... We didn't even wind up doing uh, the role. Right. So my point is, you know, with, with COVID, it, it, there were so many new obstacles and hurdles and protocols that it was like, it, it, you know, it, it was really um, somewhat of a miracle that we pulled it off. And so we had this idea for this character and we had talked about you for it. We just, we just couldn't do it. We had to, we had to make what we could make yeah. with what we had. But um, well, let, hopefully coming into season two, I will do that. All right. So this has been a, a an incredible conversation with Sean. Uh, he's he got into some real deep stuff that I wanted him to. I didn't know if he would, but he did, and that's always helps out people, right? Absolutely. Um, but I was also very entertained with the with all the you know Karate Kid and all that. It was just cool. And I appreciate you being here. Thank You're you. my friend. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, you're mine. I got to end this. I, I, I don't end these well, so I'm trying to figure out a way to end it. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I just want to say one thing. I, you know, I, I just think that everything you're doing for mental health, is, you know, in bringing it out of the shadows. Yes. And making it a conversation that is okay to talk about. Yeah. And, and not, you know, putting this dark cloak of shame that, that for so long, people have unfortunately had to had to live under is it's revelatory. I mean, this is groundbreaking that you're doing this. And I'm really honored that I could be here with you um, and just be a little part of that. And so- And I we both have that. books out. We do. Well, your book is new. My book now is about a year old, but dude, it's like, we're, you know, from where we were, Yeah. and I'm not dogging soaps, but we were just soap guys. Yeah. And now we're doing some other you stuff. You created a show. I'm created this, and yeah. I got a book. You got a book, and yeah, it's a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, and I hope the but next the next time we sit down together, we're gonna have more new and more right. interesting things because we're gonna keep we're gonna keep evolving. And it's, you know, it's 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 funny. The reason we watch the same movie over and over again, the movie doesn't change, right? But the eyes with which we yes. see it, and and what I love about this conversation is the eyes with which we see each other. Have changed yeah. since you know. Yeah. You know, you were first coming on the show, and I was a kid, and yeah. you know, now we're we're too. Uh, I didn't talk to anybody guys. like Steve says for six months. Well, <laughs> but I had a nervous you breakdown had, at you, the, Well, you know, I, I mean, I, I was reading it. You know, I was there that day in my dressing oh, room. Oh, and, and, tell and, me. Well, I mean, I was there, and I remember Shelly going into your Shelly Curtis, who I'm still very good friends with. I adore her. I love. And her. Uh, I was just talking to her the other day, and um. I knew something was going on with you. You were like the new guy. Yes. And I knew you. there was something going on, but I didn't know you well enough to talk. And I But wish, what did you see? Well, I, 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 I could tell that there was something emotional going on with you. There was an issue. Um, um, you know, and, and Shelly and I are good friends, and Shelly wouldn't go into it, but intimated that there was something. She saw it in the in the... In my acting, or she? No, remember. I mean, you even talk about it in the book, you know. Yeah, but that was after. I'm, I'm talking about before. But I remember. I, I remember. I remember a day when you went into your dressing room and Shelly went in after you. Yeah. Because our dressing rooms, I think, at one point were f close. Yes, we were very close. Right. Yes. And and I knew something was going on with you. And and frankly, you know, I wish I had known you better. And I kind of wish I was the guy I am today yeah, instead of then yeah. because I, I, I would have liked to have reached out to you because I think like you, I mean, it maybe it comes from the bullying. Um, I, I hate cruelty. I don't like to see people in pain. Um, you know, one last thing I, I'll tell you about in the book is I talk about the need for there to be increased compassion and empathy in our society. You know, you, you see an older woman waiting nervously uh at the pharmacy to get a prescription. You don't know if she's deciding, do I have dinner that night or do I get my husband his cancer medicine? Yeah. You see some guy in the rain at a bus stop. You don't know, is he fighting mental illness, yeah. substance abuse? Yeah. We never know what private war somebody else is fighting and we all fight them. Yeah, yeah, so true. All right, Sean. Love you, man. I love you too, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks.